Penn Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Associated Press, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is the Associated Press. How do you hear me? Station hears you loud and clear. How do you hear us? I hear you just fine. Good day, gentlemen. This is Marcia Dunn speaking to you from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I'd like to start out by asking about the next week's visitor, the Dragon. Uh, that has some pretty fine imagery, the astronaut night snaring the Dragon. Uh, tell, me, uh, tell me all about it and what you're doing to get ready and how prepared you feel. Uh, it's good to be talking to you, Marcia. Uh, interesting about getting ready because uh, we were practicing a bit this morning and then we put our practice on hold so we could do this PAO event. And as soon as this PAO event is over, we're going to be practicing a dragon again. And what we're what I've been doing earlier today is just doing our uh, computer simulation of the arm, which is similar to what we do on uh, at JSC. And, and right after this event, uh, we will uh, uh, float into the cupola and start flying the real arm in uh, uh, what we call offset grapples. It's, uh, it's a, a procedure where we go in and, and actually grapple, a, uh, go over a pin on a grapple fixture, and, and uh, from that point we call it good and we back up and we do it over and over and over again. So we are getting uh, prepared for uh, our visitor next week. Are you personally excited to be the one reeling Dragon in? It's a historic first. A lot of eyes are going to be on the whole process. Um, how honored are you to be the one to be there at that moment in time? Really, I see this uh, as a team effort. Andre and I are flying the arm. We're taking turns flying the arm. And it really doesn't matter who's actually flying the arm when we grapple the dragon. Uh, the important thing is that uh, we we do our part of the job for this team effort. And you got to remember there's a heap of folks on the ground that are all working on this, too. So it's not just us. It's uh, uh, orchestration of Earth and space and space station and people on space station to make this happen. So it's it's a big deal, uh, but I hope this becomes so routine that people won't even pay attention to it anymore. Well, well, that sort of segues into my next question. Um, a few months back, I remember you hearing you compare the commercial space effort with the wagon trains moving west in our own country. Talk about that a little bit. How you see this in the big history, uh, in the big picture of the history of space flight, this this new movement. Uh, well, right now, space exploration is very expensive, and it seems to be the realm of governments, and they are the ones that are defining what the mission is and what the mission objectives are. However, we're at the point now where commercial enterprise can help supply the goods and services needed to keep the government working in their forefront activities. And uh, an analogy to this is what we do in Antarctica. Uh, the Antarctic uh, research program is defined by the National Science Foundation, but the goods and services are all contracted out to commercial people that provide the food, the services, the airplanes, the, the, the housing, all of that's contracted out. So, so the government's in the business of exploring the frontier and defining the mission, and they spall off the, the support activities to commercial free enterprise, which is a very American thing to do. And, and that's what happened in, in uh, the settling of the Wild West of America, where, where the government would run the forts and define the missions, and then they would get commercial enterprise to supply the goods and services and to build the railroads. And, and I, I see this whole story repeating itself again and again as we move from low Earth orbit, and it'll probably repeat itself when we go to the moon and elsewhere. Doc, Dr. Cooper, um, what's your take on that? As a European, how momentous do you think this upcoming SpaceX launch it will be in your view? 
Well, it's it's the next uh, the start of a next era, and uh, it's a, a, a say a natural process. Uh, we've seen this, of course, uh, in the past with all kinds of uh, transportation, uh, with shipping, aviation. Uh, so this will happen in space flight as well, and uh, it, it feels uh, it feels very good to uh, to be part of that, uh, and I, I look forward to it very much. Uh, this is uh, the the start of a, a real new era, and uh, we'll continue uh, with, with a rapid pace, I expect, and there's a lot more to come. Well, um, maybe either of you can tell me, are, the, are you taking any safety precautions for this mission that you might not take for other spacecraft that have come to visit? I'm just wondering if the fact that it's a commercial vehicle versus a government vehicle will mean some changes in the rendezvous practices from your end. Any, any special precautions? Well, as you know, space flight uh, is is very uh, safe. There's a lot of safety precautions for everything we do, uh, for all the vehicles that uh, that come from all the nations, and and uh, this includes also uh, uh, the the Dragon that's coming now. So uh, uh, a lot of people on the ground uh, are working on this, and it's I can tell you it's it's very safe. We have a lot of uh, uh, of steps where we we check everything, uh, the ground and the crew and uh, and everybody. So for from that point of view, uh, it's not different than any other one, uh, it's, it's safe. And, and I'm wondering if either of you have spoken either by phone or via email with Elon Musk. Is he offering any special words of wisdom or encouragement as uh, we go into the countdown? I don't, I don't think either one of us have had a chance to chat with him. I've talked to him in the past, uh, way before this mission, about various things dealing with space flight, but uh, I, I haven't had any communication with him since this has uh, started. Uh, Dr. Pettit, for you in particular, um, you know, Americans are, 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 are taking rides on the Russian rockets until the commercial industry gets on its feet, so to speak. Um, do you see the, 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 the future of astronauts, American astronauts, space travel lying heavily on the upcoming launch as a proving ground, perhaps, as to what might follow in a few years? Uh, I see that, that any enterprise that wants to build a rocket to fly into space, that's a step in the forward direction. And we, as, as public watching in on this endeavor, need to be prepared to see a few flops because that'll happen. And think about what happens in the aviation industry. And you've seen these old pictures of airplanes with 27 wings that collapse before it even gets off the runway. And, and uh, airplanes that have things that look like umbrellas that vibrate up and down. And, and we kind of laugh at those. But at the time, these were serious efforts to try to to figure out how to fly, and uh, we'll probably see that story repeat again and again, and we just can't quit if the first time or two doesn't work right. So this is just something that it takes a lot of work. We roll up our sleeves, we try. If, it, if it's successful, great. We can't uh, let our heads get swollen up too much because there's always a failure around the corner. And when one of those happens, we just uh, regroup, sharpen our pencils, do some more calculations, make some uh, uh, engineering modifications, and, and keep going. And, and I hope that that is the ingenuity in the American process that uh, will uh, lead to a commercialization of space. Well, well, thank you for that answer. And by the way, I've been following your space zucchini, broccoli, sunflower saga. Um, a question about your coffee, though. Are you sipping coffee up there f uh, from one of your um, mugs that you like to make, or are you using the traditional pouches and straws? I know that's something you've um, toyed with in the past. I was just wondering how the coffee is going. Uh, the the coffee is going great, and uh, uh, most of the time I drink it from a bag because that's a utilitarian thing to do. You can fly around the room with a, a drink bag, and and I happen to have one here, and then I was uh, drinking uh, on the robotic workstation here as I was practicing right before this event. However, I do enjoy using my zero gravity cup and I'll drink tea and coffee from that uh, on occasion just because we're in space and we can. Well, good for you, uh, and, and best of luck next week and for the remainder of your journey, and Godspeed, uh, safe return to Earth in a few months. Thank you very much. 
Well, thanks, Marsha. It's always good to have a chat with you. And Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Associated Press portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from KRLA Radio. Station, this is KRLA Radio. How do you hear me? KRL Radio, we hear you loud and clear. Well, it's good to talk with you um, from back on Earth. What's it like up there? We see images. To me, it always looks like weightlessness is in slow motion. Is there anything to that? Uh, describe what it feels like to be in weightlessness. Uh, weightlessness, it's... Uh uh, it's the opposite of being heavy, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's hard to describe. It's wonderful. It's uplifting. You can float around the room as Andre is doing here. And we move slow because if you move fast, you can easily get things out of control. And just for example, I've got, uh, I've got a little drink bag here, and if I give it a fast push, it just disappears. It's, it's already in node two now. And you don't want to push things fast like that because you'll lose them, they'll bang around on the walls, maybe they'll knock something else loose. So one of the things that, that you rapidly learn when you come into space is that slow actually gets things done quicker than fast. What impacts does the weightlessness have on normal body functions? When you drink liquid and it goes down into our stomach, is there any sensation of it not feeling settled? Well, actually, you, you can try something yourself. You can stand on your head and you can still drink because uh, the, the, the body takes care of it. It's pushed down to your stomach. So in that sense, uh, we, can, we can eat and drink uh, what we want. The control of uh, fluids and, uh, and food in, in your, your mouth is also very good with your tongue. So there's no, uh, no issue there. Uh, so from, from eating and drinking point of view, it's, it's pretty normal. But you have to be careful with the food, uh, of course, uh, that uh, things don't escape uh, uh, because that uh, that that might uh, well make things a bit uh, dirty and things like that. But uh, uh, that is a, a thing we uh, we have to get adjusted to uh, to deal with uh, with floating uh, fluids, with floating food uh, during uh, during dinner. What about the sense of movement or uh, speed? I'm told you're moving at like 17,000 miles an hour up there, a couple hundred miles up but yet you're so far off the earth, is there no real sense or feeling of movement? Well, that's correct. Uh, you can you can compare it actually with a flight in a in an airliner at about uh, 10 kilometers at, uh, altitude because the, the angular speed is is the is the same. So the the the, the speed of the Earth passing by uh, from a plane is the the same as uh, as for us at uh, 400 kilometers uh, altitude. So uh, you see that we're moving, uh, but you don't really have the feeling uh, of enormous speed uh, like you don't have in a plane as well sound at all up there or is it just the the fans and things that run what's it like in inside the space station it's kind of like living in the engine room of a ship it, it, we're surrounded by machinery uh, space is a place where human beings cannot innately live and the only reason we could live here is by taking machines with us to provide all the functions and one of the things that that we need to have is air movement because there's no gravitational driven convection there's no wind up here and and things could get pretty stale uh, pretty quickly and so we always have fans blowing and moving air around and and that adds a certain level of background noise and then we have mechanisms like our treadmill and our stationary bicycle and and other pumps and equipment for from uh, both systems and and scientific viewpoint and all these things make uh, mechanized machine kind of noises and and when you add it all together, it's, uh, uh, it's a reminder that you are living in a machine, and the purpose of this machine is to allow you to be here. You have a uh, commercial supply ship coming um, for the first time up there. What is the importance of that? Uh, the importance of uh, the Dragon vehicle coming up is letting some entity other than the government do the supplies for 
the space station, for moving off into space. So now the governments, like uh, government-run agencies like NASA, can concentrate on the frontier aspect of being in space. They can define the mission, they can define where we're going and what we're going to be doing, uh, and then we can uh, have the commercial entities supply us the 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 goods and services that we need in order to to uh, do the mission and and I like to use the analogy of, of forts in the old west in the United States and the wagon trades that supplied the forts were run by commercial entities and later replaced by the train system but the government defined what the mission was and ran the forts and and I think we're going to see that scenario play itself over and over again as humanity moves out into space a little bit now about the risks up there, um, space debris. Sometimes we'll see stories about uh, things that are done to protect against that. Is There's a lot of junk floating up there, or do you ever see anything fly by, or would that be tough to see? Uh, there, There is a lot of junk. If you look at the radar targets that uh, where they plot, plot them as little dots around Earth, and it's like, wow, we're flying in a cloud of junk. However... Space in low Earth orbit is a big place, and the chances of actually running into one is pretty small. Uh, however, we do have to watch out for these aids, and every once in a while we do an, a, debris avoid, uh, a debris avoidance maneuver, which is a NASA acronym for DAM. So we can actually say DAM on the uh, uh, loops now, and in the context of debris, uh, you will be understood. And uh, we did, we've done a couple of dams since we've been here. And one time we did not have uh, enough warning to uh, do a dam, so we uh, went into our Soyuz as a safe haven in, in case of collision, but uh, there was not one. And so we popped out of our Soyuz and, and went back to work. And then what about these solar flares that we've been seeing from time to time in the news? Is there any extra radiation on you guys, and is there anything you do to protect yourselves? There's probably some extra radiation. However, uh, we're, we're exo-atmospheric, but we're still protected by Earth's magnetosphere. Earth, Earth is like a great big spherical magnet with a north and a south pole, and the magnetic field radiates way out into space for thousands of miles, and it intercepts these solar-generated particles and deflects them. It's kind of like... Uh, Scotty turning up the shields for the Starship <laughs> Enterprise, and, and Earth does this naturally for us, and, and so uh, we don't have to worry from a radiation safety point of view when most of these solar events occur, and the biggest effect of these is that it makes beautiful aurora, and we like to stick our noses against the window in the cupola and, and look at these, these spectacular aurora displays that happen every time the, the sun goes burp. Lastly, um, read an article about how the eyeball uh, changes a bit for those who have gone in space. Um, do you sense any changes physically when you're up there in weightlessness? Well, there's a lot of things happening with uh, the human body and weightlessness uh, because, uh, of course, uh, the, it, it functions best at uh, at one times gravity, one g, and uh, the body adapts uh, to uh, to the microgravity environment. Some things, however, like uh, like like bone loss and uh, and, and muscle uh, atrophy, uh, these are things that that continue on the long run, and we have to do things against that. Uh, now, there is indeed uh, some some uh, some new indications that things happen with the ABOP, and that this if as is going on at the moment. Uh, I mean, we have been going to space for long durations for for many many years, many many decades, and uh, so it's it's not that serious uh, that we uh, uh, that we cannot go anymore. It's just something new that's being uh, being investigated and see uh, if this is something that we have to uh, to find countermeasures against or, or something else. So at the moment, it's uh, it's it's not uh, an issue that we are very worried about. Well, it's been good uh, talking with both of you. Thank you very much. It, it's our pleasure, and come back and visit us again. We'll do that. Thank you so much. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. And thank you, Associated Press Copy that. and KRLA Radio. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication. <laughs>